Christoph Rapp, Unpacking Socrates' Core Intuition in the Gorgias. Uh, hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, very good. So, um, hi Don, hi everybody. Uh, thank you for having me here. You might be surprised to see my face uh, on the Socrates channel today. And honestly, I'm surprised too, since I gather that I'm not really renowned as a Socrates or Plato scholar. Indeed, my presentation today will be my first documented excursion to Socrates studies. All the more, I'm most grateful for this honorable invitation as it gives me the opportunity to unfold and to test a presupposition I keep making when thinking about Socrates and the adaptation of the figure of Socrates by Plato. Using the idea of the multifaceted Socrates in Plato that Dorothea Frede has coined in the last year's Socrates series, my idea is that even though Plato uses the character of Socrates for a wide range of different roles and purposes, is it is in his dialogue Gorgias that Plato tries to make sense of what I dubbed somewhat pretentiously Socrates' core intuition. So what I'm referring to is, in a word, the intuition that only the moral soul can be a happy one. While Socrates, as we know him from Plato's Apology or Crito or from Xenophon's Memorabilia, repeatedly alludes to this intuition, he refrains from elaborating on the relation between moral qualities on the one hand and well-being, happiness on the other. This is why this great intuition uh, that the morally good person will, Ceteris Paribus, also be happy, uh, rather remains a promise uh, or a postulate. So, I would be interested to learn about your experience. However, when I myself try to make sense of this Socratic idea in undergraduate seminars, I often find myself gradually supplying theorems either from later Platonic dialogues, from Aristotle, or from other Socratic schools. So even though I'm inclined to credit Socrates with this idea that, after all, pervades major parts of ancient and Greek ancient Greek and Latin moral philosophy, and is, by the way, one of the reasons why down to the present day, ancient virtue ethics is considered by many moral philosophers to provide a valuable alternative to consequentialism and Kantianism. At least the Socrates as depicted in the Apology of Crito offers little help in understanding why people who take care of their souls in order to make them virtuous and to keep them free from injustice are supposed to be actually happier. Several times, um, uh, 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 Socrates uses in this context the notions of kalos kakatos, or of oitzen, yutzen, or oipratain, yupratain. But these notions, I take it, carry themselves the ambiguity between being morally good and living a good life in the sense of living a happy life. So that one might have the impression that all the Socratic remarks about people who neglect the care of their souls or do harm to their souls by committing injustice, that all these remarks might support the claim that these people are not doing well or not living well in the moral sense, while leaving it open whether and how this actually impinges upon their being well, in the sense of well-being or happiness. Now, by saying that Plato unpacks this core intuition and tries to make sense of it, I want to imply that in doing so, Plato goes beyond the original intuition, adding something to it that is perhaps not trivial and might even mark an achievement in the development of his own thinking about the Socratic thesis. Still, I chose the words unpacking and making sense of, because I want to say that what Plato adds to this discussion is meant to be faithful 
to Socrates' original intuition, bringing out, as it were, the best version of this intuition. And this is, I take it, what reconstructive interpretation is supposed to do, i.e. offering a reconstruction of a given point of view by providing clarifications and rationales that are meant to make this point of view acceptable, i.e. acceptable even for people who have developed, as Plato may have done, more intricate differentiations and more sophisticated standards of justification. Of course, all this is not meant to rule out that there are other equally promising ways to make sense of the same intuition, which in the case of Socrates uh, can easily be proved by referring to say the cynics or the stoics to Epictetus, etc. So given this general thesis and setup, <laughs> I'm owing you at least two explanations or elaborations. First, an elaboration on how I come to speak of Socrates' core intuition and what is included, included in this alleged intuition. And second, on why of all platonic dialogues, the Gorgias is claimed to play a peculiar role in the interpretation of this core intuition. And this is what I'm going to do in the two parts of my presentation. Part one, Socrates' core intuition, and part two, Plato's Gorgias is making sense of this intuition. So is this clear and understandable so far? Uh, okay, it's reassuring to see some people nodding or smiling. Good. So thank you very much. Then I go uh, straightforwardly into my first part, Socrates' core intuition. So in what follows, uh, I'm relying first on Plato's Apology and Crito. In doing so, I'm presupposing as a rule of thumb that these two dialogues are actually written in memory of sayings and practices that are apt to characterize the historical Socrates. When referring to the circumstances of Socrates' trial and to the bill of indictment, they even preserve their bottom statements. This is not to say, however, that I take these two dialogues as historical reports, nor do I think that they are the only platonic dialogues that are supposed to characterize the historical Socrates in the way described, or that there is a sharp demarcation between these two treatises and the rest of the platonic dialogues in terms of the authenticity of the Socrates depicted. In the Apology of Socrates, according to Plato, Socrates famously uh, presents his practice of probing knowledge claims of his Athenian fellow citizens. Their failure to know what they think to know is especially with regard to what Socrates takes to be the most important things reflects poorly on the state of their souls. Socrates, by contrast, exhorts people to take care of their souls with a view to bringing them into the best, best possible state or to acquire virtue or the virtues. Other people care about wealth and honor, but virtue is the origin, Socrates says, of all other goods. And if virtue is the origin of all other goods, it provides the access to all other sources that could possibly render one's life good. This is the kind of promise that Socrates gives with regard to virtue and a good or happy life. But it needs to be explained how exactly virtue is meant to be the origin of all other goods and whether and how it contributes to well-being, provided that well-being is among the goods mentioned. So what are we supposed to do when taking care of our souls according to the Socrates of the Apology? Well, we have to avoid injustice and ignorance about the most important issues. How to accomplish this? Most probably by engaging in the peculiar activity that according to Socrates is the greatest good for human beings, namely, quote, to discuss virtue every day and those other things about which you hear me conversing and testing myself and others. Why is this supposed to be the greatest good for human beings? Frankly, 
testing views about virtue and talking about these things seems to be at best preliminary to the greatest good, even if one crowns that the possession of virtue of the soul is among the greatest goods. However, Socrates famously insists that the unexamined life is not worth living. Virtue seems to be decisive for whether one has or has not a life that is worth living, and the paira, the probing and examining of oneself and others with regard to virtue seems to be a constitutive part of both the moral improvement and of what makes life worth living. Apparently, the acquisition of virtue is connected with these examinations. And since these examinations seem to aim at singling out the best possible logos, as it is put in the credo, and since this is a thoroughly rational and cognitive endeavor, the acquisition of virtue also seems to be a cognitive endeavor, at least in the sense that one has to rid oneself of false views about these important issues. So Socrates in the Apology is unthinkable without his constant admonition to virtue and care of the soul. He gives us a hunch, but not more, of why virtue alone is capable of turning one's life into a good one. This is what I take to be the core intuition. This core intuition is also manifested in the attitude that Socrates famously displays to death and dying. It does not matter to survive for the longest possible time. What matters is to live a good life. And a good life, I take it, is a life that includes certain moral qualities, but is also worth living while the wicked life is not. The formulation, a life worth living for a human being, is tricky in the context I'm interested in. In the way it is used by Socrates, it clearly means that it is worth living owing to certain moral qualities or morally salient activities. This is, however, not to say that people choose this life just because of a moral imperative. They choose it because they find it agreeable. Agreeable in a sense that need not include downright egoistic reasons such as pleasure, profit, and power. But possibly it is agreeable in the sense that this life is thought to be valuable or meaningful, etc. Again, there is clearly an allusion to the idea that there is more to the virtuous life than just complying with certain moral standards. But this idea that the virtuous life is the kind of life we would choose instead of a longer, a richer or a more powerful life, nowhere gets unfolded. In this respect, the situation in the dialogue Crito is not that much different. Due to Crito's arrangements, Socrates is faced with a choice between the perspective of a longer life, which he could only reach by escaping from prison, and the imminent end of his life through execution, which is inevitable when he turns down Crito's suggestion. Since the option to escape would involve, as Socrates argues, uh, treating the city of Athens unjustly and doing harm to the city and its laws, Socrates decides to stay. It is in this context that Socrates asks whether life with a body that is ruined is worth living. Socrates and Crito uh, agree that it is not. A fortiori, it follows that a life in which we are harmed and ruined by unjust actions, i.e. a life with a harmed and ruined soul, as we are supposed to conclude, is even less worth living. Quote, Socrates examine the following statement in turn as to whether it stays the same or not, that the most important thing is not life, but the good life. Or it's a grito, it stays the same, Socrates. And that the good life, oi, and the beautiful noble life, kalos, and the just life, dikaios, is the same. Does it still hold or not? Crito, it does hold. So it is clear what Socrates wants to maintain. Injustice does harm to the soul, corrupts its integrity, in a sense, ruins it. The unjust life is therefore bound to be bad, i.e. unhappy, 
a life that people who understand the impact of injustice on the soul and on the way we live would definitely avoid. Only the life with a soul that is uncorrupted by injustice is worth living. The good life is just and the just life is good. In order to see the argument behind this equation, it would be crucial to understand what it means that injustice corrupts the soul. There might be an equivocation with the potential to turn the whole construction into a, a fallacy. So we usually rephrase this effect of injustice by saying that injustice corrupts the integrity of the soul, which would certainly be true, but tautological if integrity is understood as the absence of injustice. The impaired integrity of the soul does not per se yield a robust sense in which our life becomes worse in the extra moral sense. One could say that the literal sense of corrupting the soul taken as the center of moral integrity only yields a metaphorical sense of corrupting the soul in an extra moral sense. For example, corrupting the soul psychologically and with a view to whether the wrongdoer's life is better or worse. In the Christian way of thinking, for example, the sins are thought to contaminate or to stain the conscience. Quote, I always strive to keep my conscience clear before God. Book of Acts 24, 16. In this terminology, the essential point of sinning is not that it would impair the quality of life, at least not in this world, but that the stained conscience will become the subject of assessment by God. Whereas the psychological dimension of being a sinner, so the proverbial bad conscience, is only a side effect, and a side effect that only bothers those who at least try to live up to the standards set by their religion. It wouldn't affect those who do not care about these standards. So I'm saying all this just in order to illustrate that it would not be enough for Socrates' intuition to conceive the negative impact of injustice in the way the Christians, in my pedestrian understanding, frame the negative impact of sin. The intuition requires that there is a non-moral or not merely moral sense in which the life of the wrongdoer is worse. And I also warned against making unwarranted inferences from a moral sense of how injustice does harm to the soul to a non-moral sense of an impaired or corrupted soul. I mentioned psychological effects, so in the modern sense of psychological, as a possible example for not merely moral effects, for example, remorse or the Epicurean disturbances as negative emotional effects of unjust actions. But I do not want to imply that the question of oidzen, yeah, of whether someone has a good life or not, which according to Socrates, intuition is said to vary in accordance with the moral quality of the soul, is only measured in psychological terms. So in a way, uh, when insisting that Socrates' core intuition needs to be unpacked, I'm resembling the adiamantos of the Republic, requiring that it must be shown how justice, uh, because of its very self, benefits it possesses and how injustice harms them. Before I move on, I want to take at least a quick look at the Socrates in Xenophon's memorabilia. I do not think that Xenophon offers uh, due to the absence of own philosophical talent and ambitions, a privileged access to the historical Socrates. Still, I want to make sure that my dramatic composition, namely the composition which Socrates formulates a challenging intuition and Plato in his Gorgias comes to Socrates' support and tries to make sense of this intuition, I want to make sure that this dramatic composition does not just reflect an inner platonic, as it were, development. And even though the Socrates in Xenophon differs from Plato's Socrates in many not insignificant respects, we find what I call Socrates' core intuition 
also in Xenophon, and we also find that this intuition either does not get elaborated on, or it gets elaborated, but in a pretty Xenophonian fashion. As is well known, Xenophon takes pains to picture Socrates as a person with an exceptionally good character. He's playing all the traditional virtues and exceeding others through his enkrataya in order to show that the indictment against Socrates was totally ungrounded, since it would be absurd to think, or so he argues, that someone with such an outstanding character could possibly lead young people to vices. Rather, Xenophon says, he curbed these vices in many by putting into them a desire for virtue and a hope to become kalos kakatas. Socrates does so not by teaching as Xenophon is eager to emphasize, um, which would be inconsistent with the Socratic ignorance claims, but through being a role model for the young people. Ignorance of the beautiful and noble things, for example, of what is pious and what is just, would leave us in a stunted state, whereas knowledge of these important things makes us kalos kakatos. The Socrates in Xenophon keeps saying that all good and beautiful things flow from virtue in a similar way uh, to what we encountered in Plato's Apology. In book four of the memorabilia, he says that Socrates was in love with those with excellent souls, which he, Socrates, recognized by their quickness to learn whatever subject they studied, their ability to remember whatever they learned, and their desire for every kind of knowledge. Such people, he says, are themselves happy, and not only are they happy themselves, but they are also capable of conferring happiness on their fellow citizens. So all this seems to be close in a way to what we characterized in Plato as Socrates' core intuition. Virtuous people are expected to live a happier life. Xenophon's Socrates is an intellectualist through and through. Whoever knows what is beautiful and good acts accordingly. There's no difference between Sophia and Sophrosyne by knowledge and temperance, rather a uh, temperance or self-mastery. Accordingly, Socrates' principal virtue, according to Xenophon, is enkrataya. Xenophon's notion of enkrataya spans from the ascetic ideal of needlessness, endurance, and grit. So for example, Socrates, the beginning of the memorabilia is said to endure extreme cold and heat. It spans from this sort of crit to the virtue which makes us act in accordance with what we know to be good. If there is an attempt in Xenophon to make sense of Socrates' core intuition, it is based on his peculiar understanding of Socratic enkrataya, presumably in the sense that the enkrates person is better off because she's able to distinguish between what is good and what is bad, and then acts in accordance with what is good, which makes her life better, whereas not acting in accordance with what is good would make it worse. It seems to me that this kind of advantage can boil down to rather banal things. For example, in the passage from the beginning of the fourth book I mentioned above, Xenophon says that those people with excellent souls who are good at learning are themselves happy and kai manage their households well. So household management seems to represent a perspective that is typical for Xenophon. While according to other sources, it does not seem to be among Socrates' primary concerns. The interesting point is that this might reflect Xenophon's understanding of the Encrates person and why she is happy. The Encrates people succeed in managing their households, whereas people who lack this virtue fail to distinguish between what is good and bad or fail to act in accordance with what is good. And hence they are less successful in household management and all other affairs of human life. So all this would deserve a more in-depth scrutiny. 
in the next section about Plato's Gorgias, we will encounter a prominent role of Enkrataya again. One could wonder whether both Plato and Xenophon take recourse to a genuinely Socratic preference for this particular word. However, to be honest, the memorabilia is a mixed bag, perhaps composed of passages that were written at different times. And in particular, the fourth book shows Xenophon's familiarity with some of Plato's dialogues. So I conclude my discussion of Xenophon with the rather tentative result that Xenophon Socrates, not less than Plato's, alluded to the set of intuitions that the unjust life cannot be happy, that we hence have to acquire virtues, which are thought to make our lives better in one way or the other, and that the acquisition of virtues is primarily a matter of knowledge. I had the impression that Xenophon is also struggling with what to make of this intuition, and that he is inclined towards thinking that the upshot of all this consists in thinking that rational, deliberate guidance is better and more advantageous than unmastered agencies in all aspects of human life. So this concludes the first part of my presentation. Are you still with me? Um, and <clears throat> by now, I hope uh, I managed to persuade you that there is a problem in at least the decree of elaborating on the intuition that the virtuous life is actually happier than the vicious life. And in particular, so I'm concerned about fallacies that uh, might be uh, at work here by saying that, oh, the just life uh, is good. What does good mean then? Is good just another word for moral integrity? which would make the claim tautological, but true, or is it meant to be uh, good in an extra moral sense? So in a way in which it is actually better for us to live this kind of life than the opposite kind of life. And this transition from the moral sense of saying, yeah, the just life is good to a good life in a non-moral sense, that's, I think, uh, the challenge that has to be addressed. And <clears throat> I honestly, I, I would admit that there are several attempts in Plato's dialogues to deal uh, with this problem and to deal with this gap. But in particular, I think that his Gorgias marks a major step forward in trying to make sense of this intuition. And this is what I'm trying to say in the second part of my presentation. So part two, making sense of Socrates' core intuition in the Gorgias. Plato's Gorgias is mostly associated with the topic of rhetoric. The subtitle in the printed editions of the Greek text of the Gorgias is peri Rhetoric case. And indeed, the dialogue starts with a discussion between Socrates and the sophist and rhetorician Gorgias about the art of rhetoric, whether it is an art at all and what it is about. This topic of rhetoric is carried over to the second part of the dialogue, where a person by the name of Polos steps in, in order to defend Gorgias' point of view. In the course of the exchange with Polos, the conversation turns to other topics. For example, whether the orators who are admired by Polos because of their supposedly unlimited power within the city actually do what they really want to do, uh, whether doing what is unjust is actually better than suffering it, and finally, whether it is good to avoid the deserved punishment through the power of rhetoric, or whether it is better to be punished and thus relieved from the burden of the committed crime. This is the point where Socrates' third interlocutor in the Gorgias Callicles steps in because Callicles thinks that Polos should not have conceded that doing what is unjust is more shameful than suffering it. 
At this point, the nature and power of rhetoric is no longer the main concern. It is clear by this stage of the dialogue that the lively exchange about rhetoric from the beginning has turned into a confrontation of two competing life forms, which one which is oriented towards knowledge and sophrosyne, and one that neglects knowledge, despises any form of moderation, and regards power and pleasure as intrinsically desirable. This latter perspective on how to live is explicitly advocated by Calicles, who famously distinguishes in the Gorgias between what is just by nature and what is just by law. Those who are stronger and more powerful by nature are restrained, or so Calicles says, by lawful justice, which keeps saying that it is unjust if they want to have more. Whereas by nature, it is just that those who are strong, prudent, and courageous in public affairs deserve to have, have a greater share in everything, especially with regard to political power. Political power, again, enables a rampant lifestyle, according to which one ought to allow one's appetites to get as large as possible without restraint. Because the means to satisfy all these appetites are made available by political power, which also helps people to remain unpunished, unpunished whenever the satisfaction of the appetites is accomplished by crimes or other unjust actions. In response to Caligula's provocation, the character Socrates first refutes the hedonistic premises of this amoral life form, and then outlines the alternative form of living, which is based on knowledge and virtue, and is shown to be, in the end, happier than the life of maximal appetite satisfaction. And of course, it is this latter context I'm drawing on when I claim that Gorgias tries to make sense of Socrates intuition. I will turn to this context and the main passage within this context almost immediately. But let me first add a few more remarks on how this philosophically central passage of the dialogue Gorgias is embedded into the dialogue and how all of this is related to Socrates. In a way, this may sound strange, so please keep calm, as Socrates would say. So, me turibaita. So, in a way, the dialogue Gorgias is not overly interested in the art of rhetoric. In the beginning of the dialogue, as a warm up, so to speak, Plato lets the character Gorgias display some of his rhetorical fireworks. But afterwards, there is no single word about particular rhetorical devices of this time. This is in stark contrast with the Phaedrus, which presents various rhetorical techniques in such a detail that it can even be used for reconstructing the state of the art of rhetoric in Plato's days. In the Gorgias, by contrast, what really matters is the concession by the character Gorgias that he can do, or so he thinks, without knowledge, and in particular, without knowledge of what is just. It is this concession by Gorgias that gives rise to the ensuing dialogue and to the change of the topic. As Plato is mostly interested in spelling out alleged presuppositions of a life form that is totally unconcerned about the quest for knowledge and for what is just. Such a life form, Plato submits, must be driven by other motives, which are gradually revealed by the more radical interlocutors, Polos and Caligles, namely political power and influence, which again, without knowledge of what is good and just, are only 
or mostly useful within a radically hedonistic framework so that their lives are ultimately about power, profit, and pleasure. So rhetoric in the Gorgias stands for a competing form of living, one that is negligent of knowledge to cure and of knowledge of what is just. After having rejected this life form and after having argued for an alternative way of life, i.e. the Socratic one, Plato has his character Socrates point out why it is not important to escape death and death penalty, penalty at all costs, and that nothing is virtuous about striving for the longest possible life. He lets him sketch his mission of adhering the fellow citizens to virtue again, just as in the apology, outlining again his method of pyra. And this again gives him the opportunity to give a longer version of his probe of former statesmen, uh, because you know in the apology he gave a very brief version of this probe. Plato lets him, the character of Socrates, accuse the Athenian politics uh, according to his standards of making citizens better and not giving them what they what might flatter or please them at a particular point. Finally, the character Socrates anticipates that he will be sentenced by the Athenians. And this already marks the transition to the concluding mythos. So what I'm suggesting is that here in this final part of the dialogue, after having defended as I'm going to claim Socrates intuition, Plato's character Socrates is getting as close as possible to Socrates. At least uh, this concluding part of the dialogue is therefore about Socrates and does not just use him as the often quoted mouthpiece. So this sets the stage for my main point. And here's my main point. Callicles takes for granted that people, if they only have the means to do what they want, would naturally go for the life of unrestrained appetites and appetite satisfaction. Accordingly, he finds it ridiculous even to entertain the idea that anybody could aspire to live the life of moderation as the character Socrates suggests. Hence, it is no longer enough for Socrates to argue that a life of injustice would be shameful or anything. He now has to put his cards on the table. He has to show in what sense the life of virtue is better and happier. For only then, if the life of virtue can be shown to be better, people who do what they do for the sake of the good would choose this way of living. And this is exactly what I was missing in the former portrayals of Socrates I quoted. And here is what I take to be Plato's attempt to make sense of Socrates' core intuition. It is argued that the goodness of each thing is determined by a peculiar arrangement and order, taxis kai cosmos. As each other thing, the soul has a peculiar arrangement and order. The unordered soul is the one that is unrestrained, a kolastos, and that needs to be withheld from its appetites, epitumiae. Accordingly, the ordered soul is in the opposite state, which is called sophrosyne. The argument requires that sophrosyne is understood as the opposite of the unrestrained, unmastered, and unorderly state, so that sophrosyne in the Gorgias comes close to, or can even be substituted for enkrataya, self-mastery. This is why the ordered soul is sophron, and why sophrosyne becomes the principal virtue from which 
all other virtues can be derived. The good soul is the happy soul. The progress, if you like, compared to saying that the just soul is the happy soul, as in the Greto, lies in the new account of the goodness of the soul. The argument of the peculiar order, however rudimentary it seems to be, holds the same argumentative place in the Gorgias as the Aragon arguments in Plato's Republic and in Aristotle's Eudemian and Nicomachean Ethics does. For it defines the condition for the goodness of the soul on independent grounds, and only then shows that these conditions are matched only by the virtuous soul. It is peculiar to the dialogue gorgeous and due to its argument of the peculiar order uh, that virtue becomes more or less equated to sophrosyne. In this respect, sophrosyne, guaranteeing the order of the soul, holds a similar brace as the peculiar notion of dikaiosyne in the Republic. The account of goodness of the soul again, similar to the Republic and Aristotle's ethical writings, is meant to provide both criteria for the goodness of the soul and prescriptions for how to form a good soul. The still unrestrained, unorderly souls must be shaped by laws and rules that prevent the still uncultivated souls from indulging to each and every appetite. The success and endpoint of this educational process is defined by the ordered self-mastering soul, which seems to imply, most of all, that the appetites are not in an uproar or in rebellion against the attempt to act for the sake of what is good. This is the general picture I'm suggesting. The point is that we are no longer supposed to shift back and forth between the just life being good and the good life being just, thus risking either to read good in a downright moral sense or to jump from a moral to an extra moral meaning. Rather, we are given an independent account of the goodness of each thing and the goodness of the soul on the basis of which the self-mastering soul in what I take to be a semi-descriptive and semi-normative sense is shown to be good. It's semi-descriptive because it's descriptive to say that it masters the appetites and it is normative as soon as archetypic vocabulary is used to describe uh, or to characterize this thing, i.e. sophrosyne. So again, um, it's on the basis of this independent account of the goodness of the soul that the self-mastering soul is shown to be good. The propertory middle term being, as it were, the term of an ordered soul. So the innovation of the Gorgias can be subdivided into two aspects. First, the overall strategy to account for the goodness of the soul first and to show on the basis of this account that a good soul needs to be virtuous. And second, the model of the ordered soul, which is just one theoretical option, I take it, to account for the goodness of soul and can, in principle, be replaced by something else, for example, the Aragon argument. So I, I suggest that before I go on to uh, my conclusion, I, I would quickly uh, run with you through the two decisive uh, passages of text. So this is here my text one, the goodness of each thing consists in a peculiar arrangement or order, it runs like this, Socrates. Well then, won't a good man, the man who speaks with regard to what is best, say whatever he says, not randomly, but with a view to something, just like the other craftsmen, each of whom keeps his own product in view and so does not select and apply randomly what he applies, but so that he may give his product some shape. Take a look at painters, for example, if you would, or house builders or shipwrights or any of the other craftsmen you like and see 
how each one places what he does into a certain organization and compels one thing to be suited for another and to fit to it until the entire object is put together in an organized and orderly way. The other craftsmen too, including the ones we were mentioning just lately, the ones concerned with the body, physical trainers and doctors, this is a back reference to the beginning of the dialogue, no doubt give order and organization to the body. Do we agree that this is so or not? Caligles, let's take it that way, Socrates. So if a house gets to be organized and orderly, it would be a good one. And if it gets to be disorganized, it would be a terrible one. Caligles, I agree. Socrates, this holds true for a boat too. Caligles, yes, Socrates. And we surely take it to hold true of our bodies too. Caligles, yes, we do. Socrates, what about the soul? Will it be a good one if it gets to be disorganized or if it gets to have a certain organization and order? So taxis and cosmos. Caligles, given what we said before, we must agree that this is so. Yeah? And uh, here is a text taken from a passage that comes soon afterwards. However, this is the passage in which Caligles refuses to answer Socrates' question so that this becomes a fictional, a fictitious uh, dialogue between Socrates and himself. Socrates says, listen then, as I pick up the discussion from the beginning, is the pleasant the same as the good? It isn't as Caligles and I have agreed. Is the pleasant to be done for the sake of the good or the good for the sake of the pleasant? The pleasant for the sake of the good. And the pleasant is that by which, when it's come to be present in us, we feel pleasure and good that by which, when it's present in us, we are good. That's right. But surely we are good, both we and everything else that is good, when some excellence has come uh, to be present in us. Yes, I do think that's necessarily so, Caligus. But the best way in which the excellence of each thing comes to be present in it, whether it's that of an artifact or of a body or a soul as well or of an animal, is not just any random way, but is due to whatever organization, correctness, craftsmanship is bestowed on each of them. Is that right? Yes, I agree. So it's due to the organization that the excellence of each thing is something which is organized and has order. Yes, I'd say so. So it's when a certain order, the proper one for each thing comes to be present in it, that it makes each of the things there are good. Yes, I think so. So also a soul which has its own order is better than a disordered one. Of course it is. And an orderly soul is a self-controlled one, absolutely. So a self-controlled soul is a good one. I, for one, can't say anything else beyond that, Caligles, my friend. If you can, please teach me. Caligles, say on, good man, and bring it to an end. So I will also try to bring it to an end uh, by... Um, drawing my conclusions um, now. So at this point, one could object many things, of course, but above all, one could object that so far it has been established that a good soul is ordered and the ordered soul needs to be sovereign, but that it has not been established or not in so many words that a good soul, which is ordered and self-mastering is happy or is constitutive of a happy life. In a similar way, one could say that it is not much more plausible to say that a good soul, which is ordered, is also happy or leads to a happy life, than saying, as in the Crito, that the just life is happy or that the just soul is necessary for the happy life, which would mean that there's not much progress compared to the Crito. So in a word, does all this help us to understand why the life of someone with a good soul, in the sense defined, is supposed to be happy. My answer is the following. Take Aristotle's 
Ergon argument. It establishes, strictly speaking, what the good for a human being is. He takes this to be essential for delineating human eudaimonia. Only afterwards, after having established what the good for a human being is, he refers to reputable and commonly accepted opinions about eudaimonia in order to show that the deductively established account of what the good for a human being is actually corresponds to what we expect happiness to be. He uses the reputable and commonly accepted opinions to give, as it were, a phenomenology of happiness. And it is through the help of this phenomenology that Aristotle manages to show that an activity of the soul in accordance with virtue, which defines the good for a human being, actually manifests itself as what we take to be happiness. Similarly, in Plato's Republic, even though the idea of the just and good soul, which is harmonious since each part of it fulfills its peculiar task, has been established early on in book four, it is left to book nine to give a phenomenology of the unjust and tyrannic person in order to prove that such a person cannot be happy and thus to show why the just person is happy. I conclude from these two examples that it might be regarded as a separate step to show why a good person, uh, uh, a person whose soul is in a good shape in accordance with virtue, is actually happy. So I suggest that something similar happens in the Gorgias. There are indeed two passages that include a phenomenology of the life of the akolastos, the person with the unrestrained soul, suggesting that this life is miserable uh, while the opposed form of living is happy or is happy in the common understanding. The first, as it were, phenomenological passage precedes the argument of the ordered soul. It is part of the simile of the chars, which continues the simile of the sieve. Two men have several chars filled with brushes and rare liquids. However, while the chars of one man are sound and full, so that he does not have to care about them and can be calm and tranquil, the chars of the other are leaky and rotten so that he is forced to keep on filling them and suffers extreme pain. Both men are compared to the sophron and to the acolastos, suggesting that the one is happy and the other cannot be happy. The second phenomenological passage follows immediately after the argument of the ordered soul, pointing out that someone with an unrestrained, unmastered soul cannot be friend with anybody neither with man nor God, which can be taken to illustrate his miserable life. Apart from these two passages, the dialogue Gorgias several times alludes to the idea that due to the lack of order in the soul, the appetites grow too strong and take over control. Such a life, it is suggested, cannot be happy because it is impossible to carry out any plan or resolution for the sake of what we take to be good. Which brings me to my final point. The notions of arrangement and order refer to the relative position and role of different parts. Speaking of an ordered soul would be pointless without implying that there are various players, to put it cautiously, aspects or parts involved. The unordered soul is characterized by strong appetites that cannot be controlled anymore. The ordered soul, by contrast, is characterized negatively by not having such strong appetites and positively by mastering or controlling. So I take it that this again implies two things. First, uh, the good soul that is sophron is oriented towards knowledge of what is good. It, the good and virtuous soul, does what it does because of the good. Second, it masters, i.e. it keeps down impulses 
that could possibly obstruct agency in accordance with what is known to be good. This is to say that the dialogue Gorgias, even though it avoids explicit mariological language, appeals to the partition of the soul. There are no hints of a tripartite model as in the Republic, but a model of the soul implied in the Gorgias makes use of a bipartition. Appetites, epitomiae, are mentioned by name as the player that needs to be controlled, whereas the controlling agent remains mostly anonymous. In 491e, Socrates says, quote, being self-controlled and master of oneself, sophona onta kai en krate auton hea tu, ruling the pleasures and appetites within oneself, ton hedonon kai epitimon achonta ton en heauto. In the course of the simile of the chars, he says, quote, and fools he named uninitiated, suggesting that that part of the souls of fools where their appetites are located. So, tutotes psyches hu kai epitimia eisen. So, that that part of the souls of fools where their appetites are located is their undisciplined part. So, translating here tutotes psyches. Uh, is tricky because it's hard to translate it without inserting the word part, tutotes psyches, where the epitomiae are located. It remains therefore true that the Gorgias avoids explicit mariological language, but still it is plausible. Is, for example, also uh, Louis-André Dorion suggests to read this passage as referring to a part of the soul where the appetites are located. In general, models of the soul that distinguish between a rational and a non-rational part, or after all, between non-rational desires that can or cannot be controlled and are opposed to what one wishes as a result of rational deliberation, offer a plenty of possibilities to illustrate the psychological consequences that follow from a soul that is not that is not in a good and virtuous state. The most obvious example is, of course, the experience of inner conflict. And inner conflicts, again, are intuitively incompatible with what we take to be a happy person. In this respect, I take it, the Gorgias marks a major step in making sense of Socrates' core intuition that the virtuous person is happy and the vicious is not. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I'll clap on behalf of the muted hordes. Um, we now move to discussion. Uh, the method we use is uh, if you wish to make a comment or ask a question, please click the raise your hand button. If you have trouble with that uh, uh, function, uh, send send me a message by chat. Let's see. Um, William Altman. Uh, yes, Professor Rapp, I, I would uh, like you to uh, explain the connection uh, between your views, um, especially about Socrates, uh, to connect them to Aristotle and uh, Hans Joachim Kramer. Uh, as you know, Kramer uh, emphasizes very heavily the cosmos and taxis passage, in fact, to the exclusion of much else in the Gorgias, and sees it as an anticipation or rather an indication of the presence of the unwritten Principian Lara. Um, and of course, the idea of a dualistic or tripartite soul that, as I think you accurately point out, seems to be implied somehow by the taxis and cosmos 
um, it was taken by Aristotle, of course, to be the boundary between Socrates and Plato. In other words, that it was Plato who introduced the tripartite soul and rehabilitated Acrasia against Socratic intellectualism. So um, I want you to respond to the claim that, uh, that it's curious that you are locating what is distinctively Socratic in what Kramer thinks is the Principian Lara, which not even Kramer has the audacity to claim uh, was accepted by Socrates, but, but wants very badly to say that it's Platonic, uh, and, and, and Aristotle, whose, uh, whose notion of, uh, of, of uh, the, the Platonic innovation on Acrasia, the rejection of Socrates on the tripartite soul would seem to indicate that what what Professor Rapp is talking about is, as peculiarly Socratic is in fact essentially Platonic. I, I think that, that perhaps both Aristotle and Kramer might make that claim and I'd like you to speak back to these <laughs> learned gentlemen and uh, justify further your claim that what they would regard as distinctively Platonic is in fact uh, essentially and quintessentially Socratic. Oh, okay, oh, thank you, thank you very much. It's funny because you can't know that I was a student of Hans Joachim Kramer, at least in my first three semesters. But since he did not persuade me of the pervasive uh, impact of the Principian Lehre, I changed the university after that. And uh, so, I mean, this <laughs> uh, is also, I mean, in the background of my answer. I, I, I mean, I, 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 I do believe that uh, Aristotle correctly refers in his metaphysics to um, uh, unwritten platonic principles and that they play a major role uh, in Plato's at least late metaphysical thinking. I think it's uh, uh, one of the achievements of the Tübingen school and the Scuola di Tübingen e Milano <laughs> to have reconstructed the discussion in the old academy on the basis of the assumption of these principles. But I do not think that they pervade all of Plato's philosophy nor of Aristotle's uh, philosophy. In particular, when it comes to the notion of RT, I think so Aristotle is free to think that uh, practical philosophy is just a different endeavor that can and that cannot be just derived from metaphysical principles. So arete in the ethics in Aristotle, this is what I would find implausible or exaggerated in Kramer's view, is quite independent from uh, the principles of Plato's unwritten doctrine. And uh, so also, I mean, I'm, yeah, that's a complicated discussion, but I mean, the, these two principles uh, seem to become more and more important in Plato's later dialogues. I don't think that each and every reference to cosmos uh, implies a reference to these principles or makes use of these principles. So um, I, I think that speaking of cosmos uh, taxes arrangement in the Gorgias is not fully independent from Plato's metaphysics for as we saw in the text I read out, he also refers to aide that are <laughs> um, by which the soul is shaped. It is brought into a certain eidos which might refer to Plato's uh, uh, teachings uh, about uh, eternal forms uh, and ideas. But I, 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 I do not see that this alone requires any reference to the principles or that it would make them, the notion of cosmos and taxis more intelligible. So, I mean, I, I think we, we can make this reference to taxis and cosmos intelligible uh, on the basis of the examples that uh, Plato himself offers. So it's an 
analogy to craftsmanship and it takes up a point that was important at the earlier stage of the dialogue namely that there are um, mm -mm, people who do what they do with a view to the best i.e knowing what is best whereas others do not care about what is best but just try to flatter the audience as the rhetorician or to flatter the citizen as the bad, bad statesman. So this is in a nutshell what I would answer to this uh, challenge, to this grammar challenge. Other questions, uh, I encourage people not to be shy. There's a tendency with a large group like this to think, oh, I'll, I'll uh, defer to others. And if everyone does that, then uh, no one ever raises their hand. So I'd like to encourage you to, um, uh, uh, to not be shy. Uh, Dan Graham. All right. Can you hear me all right now? Y yes. Good to see right. you. Good to see you. Uh, thank you for a delightful presentation. It's very, very uh, thought provoking here. Um, I have one way I want to support your general approach here, and that's just to say, the way I see the, Gor the Gorgias, I, I think that Plato is defending Socrates' memory here in a sort of different way than in the Apology and Crito. And so I agree with that. And I think there are signs at the beginning that we won't have time to look at or anything, but that he is reacting to Polycrates, the sophist, and probably Isocrates, both who come up with sort of second generation objections to Socrates and so forth. And there do seem to be some allusions to their work here. And so this is a sort of second apology to the people who didn't get it the first time around or whatever. Uh, and I think, you know, the aim is to illuminate the Socratic position. But I'm, uh, <clears throat> I find it a little difficult to think, and again, I think of Socrates as more of an intellectualist than someone who sees, uh, sees virtue as a, a, a struggle between say knowledge and appetite and so forth. I, tend, I see him as uh, looking at, it's, you know, it's all knowledge, everything is knowledge. And I would suggest at least the possibility. I, I liked your argument, I thought it was uh, very interesting, but even the idea of ordering can be framed within a kind of intellectualist perspective in the sense that you can say, hey, the point of ordering everything is to make everything subordinate to the ultimate good. And in that way, we don't really need to worry about suppressing our desires. We just need to identify what's really good and then we will desire what is good because uh, again, our, our will is conditioned by our knowledge, not vice versa. Um, if we, again, if we're intellectualists and not voluntarists on this score. Now the one, so a couple of thoughts on this, uh, this is one of them is, I want to challenge you on the translation of sophron as self-control. <laughs> It can mean that, and a lot of our English translations use it that way. <laughs> but whereas in Krates, okay, that one obviously is, but sophron quite literally means being of a sound mind. And in some passages here, it's contrasted with being afron. Um, and so it doesn't, the word itself doesn't support the claim. The, the word could be translated as someone of, you know, of, judicious intelligence rather than somebody who is controlling his desires uh, there. Now, I did the passage in 491E, that's a good one. I think that does support your case. But let me just go to the end now. I don't wanna to take too much time here, but um, the, the thing that strikes me most about this within the kind of Socratic Platonic framework is the fact that in this place, um, we have Plato, Looking at Gorgias, uh, we have Plato attributing to Socrates. He, he, he says, um, he, he goes on to say that we must um, uh, 
we need not only to be to uh, have good desires and so forth, but we need a techne, we need an art, a craft, a virtue. And so finally, you know, this one striking passage, which is, I don't know, to me, it's quite unusual and quite certainly very unplatonic. Um, and this is at, uh, I'm just reading a translation here, but 521D. Um, I believe that I'm one of a few Athenians so as not to say I'm the only one, but the only one among our contemporaries to take up the true political craft, politike techne, uh, and practice the true politics. Now, in most of these the dialogues, he says, I don't have any special knowledge, I don't have anything, but here in, the, in there, he, he sort of takes his mask off, so Plato takes Socrates' mask off and says, I do have a techne, and this is my techne, my is using my, again, his practice of the Olympus to bring out uh, what is, uh, anyway, bring out uh, what's right and what's wrong to identify what the real good is. That's, again, a very uh, kind of intellectualist view on this. But I think in these passages, he's stressing what is needed um, and let me just briefly hit five, uh, what we're about five, nine E. What about doing what's unjust, Socrates says? Is it when he doesn't do it, is that sufficient or he won't do it? Uh, or should he procure a power and a craft for this too? So that unless he learns and practices it, the craft, the techne, he will commit injustice. Um, and so, what we need here is a techne, but the techne again is aimed, the po whole point of the techne is to identify the good that everything aims at. And then once, once you know what you're aiming at then everything else falls into place. So I'll shut up now. <clears throat> well, thank, thank you very much for uh, your questions. <clears throat> well, I look, I think, yes, of course. I mean, uh, uh, partition of the soul <laughs> opens to a, to uh, inner conflicts and to accuracy, uh, which uh, according to um, yeah, standard picture of uh, Socratic intellectualism and as defended in the Protagoras is impossible. But I mean, um, I, 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 I read it the way you rephrased it, namely to say that Socrates still thinks that there is knowledge or a kind of knowledge such that it makes all other motives or um, desires subordinate. And I mean, this uh, is, I think, the point of view in the, in, the, in, in the Gorgias, that having this knowledge would make uh, the person who has this knowledge <clears throat> and is sovereign does not have this problem of appetites providing an inner conflict because knowledge as such is um, sufficient for making them subordinate. On the translation of uh, Sophrosyne, yes, that's, it's, it's, it's true. I mean, I, I, I was inclined uh, to think that uh, he uses Sophrosyne in the Gorgias and in particular in this passage that I read out in a peculiar way, because it's the it's always opposed with the person who is akolastos, and uh, uh, who does not master his or her desires. So, what the ordered soul requires in order to be ordered in the first place uh, is to master. Uh, these uh, uh, appetites. So uh, I was thinking that in this particular context, Sophrosyne really comes close to uh, Enkrataya, even though this uh, might not be uh, the case in the Charmides. What does Gottfried Heinemann say? Yeah, uh, for example, in the Charmides. Uh, uh, finally, on uh, Socratic ignorance, and um, 
what is the position of the Gorgias with regard to the old Socratic ignorance? Yes, in a way, it's true that it is um, postulated that there is such a techne. Uh, on the other hand, I, I had the impression that there are passages where Plato struggles to bring this in line with good old Soc Socratic ignorance, for example, in 509a, where he says, and yet for my part, so Socrates is speaking, my account is ever the same. I don't know how these things are, uh, but no one I've ever met as in this case can say anything else without being ridiculous. Um, so, and this in a way picks up on Socrates' attitude in the Crito also. So saying, oh yeah, I, I don't know anything for sure, but uh, doing unjustice <laughs> is bad. And I haven't met anybody who was able to refute this claim. So in, in this sense, the techne could be could rest on at least provisional knowledge. So as long as someone comes along and manages to refute this logos. Thank you. Uh, all right, um, Paul Woodruff. Well, thank you for uh, engaging talk. I, 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 I am very sympathetic with most of what you're doing. Uh, I think in response to Dan's point, uh, we had quite a good presentation from Julia Annis uh, quite recently arguing against the thesis that Socrates holds knowledge sufficient for virtue. Mm -hmm. And I, I was, uh, I'm at least in that camp. Uh, but setting that issue to one side, uh, the point about Zofrazune in the Gorgias is, uh, I understand this way, that Zofrazune, which is a very desirable trait because it's the order that allows you to live a happy life, uh, is uh, vulnerable to damage by wrongdoing, that wrongdoing introduces conflict into the soul. Uh, and as I understand, the way this is operating, uh, it's not operating uh, with a a pre-designed uh, theory of parts of the soul. Uh, instead, it's a thesis about the soul, according to which the soul comes apart into warring factions as a result of wrongdoing. Oh, yeah. Interesting. And mm -hmm. so uh, the uh, antidote to this uh, damage to the soul uh, is not, uh, as I understand it, uh, uh, Kratos, uh, if you need Kratos in order to keep the desires in control, uh, you're already a victim to the kind of moral injury that gives too much power to the desires that the soul, uh, un un unless it's been fractured by wrongdoing, uh, is, is, is not at war with itself. Uh, and a footnote to the Republic, uh, even in Book Nine of the Republic, it's not Kratos that reason uses to control desire, it's patho. Uh, yes, and, and, and so it's not, and you see patho as opposed to bia. As opposed to bia or Kratos, yes. Okay. And uh, uh, how does this, apply to, does this apply to my thesis about the Gorgias or do I have to well, take I think this I, account? I think I agree with your thesis. Yeah. I mean, the way to, to be happy is to avoid the wrongdoing that would fracture the soul. Yes. And uh, the, the important point is not uh, exercising uh, Kratos over the desires. The important thing is, is uh, not to commit injustice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's your main thesis. I just wanted mm. to clarify yep. that the role of Kratos is 
uh, comes Kratos would come in only after uh, virtue was already failed. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, I I, I agree with that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I enjoyed the talk. Th thank you very much. Um, all right. Well, we're about out of. Oh, we've got time for one last question. Stefano Stefanides, and please be concise. Yes, I'll try to be as concise as possible. Can you hear me? Hi, Stefanos. Hello. Thanks, Christoph, for the paper. Very much enjoyed it. And I um, have to say, agreed with your somewhat developmental narrative. Um, but when you were speaking of the goodness of the soul being sketched on independent grounds um, yeah. in, in the Gorgias, namely order itself, I was surprised that you didn't bring up that famous uh, passage at the climax of Socrates' dialectical exchange with Callicles. Um, which culminates in the praise of geometrical equality. And I, I was wondering to what extent you think that in those independent grounds, um, namely order, are underpinned by this kind of new cosmological framework that Plato seems to bring up for the first time in the Gorgias. Um, this idea that the world and all things in it are held together in a certain order. Um, and maybe that's an answer to your um, to your point about Plato unpacking Socrates' claim. The kind of Plato and his kind of recent um, mathematical discoveries and journey with Pythag Pythagoreanism, um, sort of adding further flesh to Socrates' uh, original claim or intuition, as you put it. Oh, okay, yeah, that, that's interesting. Thank you very much, Stephanus. Uh, actually, I was not thinking of Pythagoreanism or geometry. Uh, I, I, I rather take this argument uh, that uh, each thing is good owing to a proper peculiar order to be very close to what we get in the Ergon argument. So it's, it's, it's an attempt to say, Okay, so goodness of each thing. What does it mean? Yeah, what could we possibly refer to? And I mean, there is also this, like in the Ergon argument, there is this uh, idea of what is peculiar, what is appropriate, what is proper to this or that thing. And um, mm, I think it's a small step from here to asking what a proper function of each thing is. So one argument focuses more on, 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 on the function of the use of it. The other focuses more on, as it were, the constitution or the arrangement. And um, um, yeah. Yeah, as, as I said in my first answer, I, <laughs> I think we could accept this claim without accepting overly metaphysical burdens. I mean, saying, I mean, still we are in this, I mean, this analogy to the artifacts is still very important. And I mean, uh, the artisan, who knows what he wants to do. He's intending to bring a certain form or structure or arrangement in the thing he or she is going to build. And uh, so is the statesman with knowledge of what is good. And I think this analogy is instructive for thinking that the statesman too, instead of just flattering or indulging to what the citizens want him to do, giving them, giving them what they want, he intends to impose a certain structure in accordance yeah. with his knowledge of what is good, but, and but, that but, this is what makes each soul good. Yes, but even the language of a craftsman looking towards a certain model, apos lebon pros yeah. Even that is quite suggestive of Plato's kind of high metaphysics. So I, I, I'm yeah. not sure how far we can kind of tear apart this, you put it, the kind of ergon argument in Plato, which I, which I agree with on its own. Yes. 
No, look again. Uh, like I, as I said the... to William, I I agree in so far as ADOS and forms are implied. Obviously, this is illusion is an allusion to forms, but uh, I I would be reluctant to go further and to ask for the foundation of forms referring to principles or to Pythagoreanism, etc. So I. I, I grant that it's not without metaphysics. It Im implies forms for sure. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, we're about out of time. So let's thank our speaker for uh, a rich and interesting talk. And uh, I hope to see um, all of you again in mid January. Um, again, I'll applaud on behalf of the muted hordes. Thank you very much. Thank you for your uh, answers and thank you for your patience.